Hi, and welcome. Today we have two stories, both relating to how social media can lead to murder. This first video comes from the Netherlands, or Holland, whichever they call it these days. Joyce Howe, or Wincy as her friends called her, was born in Hong Kong on May 5, 1996, and moved to the Netherlands at an early age. She was an intelligent girl, who always got good grades. Her friends and family said she was a lovely young girl, with her whole life ahead of her. Wincy first met Polly, in Arnhem Rivers International School, where they both attended. They quickly became best friends, and for years, they became inseparable. But what started as a petty dispute, would soon become bitter rivalry between the two girls, and would turn into something even more deadly. At first, it seemed like any other teenage disagreement between the two girls, one being jealous of the other, or one getting more attention, just normal teenage arguments. But a Facebook post by Wincy would enrage Polly and escalate the situation, resulting in murder. Wincy commented on a post on Polly's Facebook wall, in which she referred to Polly as a slut. Polly was absolutely furious by it, but didn't comment back, or message Wincy directly about it. Although several others commented on the post, warning Wincy that she needs to be careful and needs to shut up or something bad will happen. The two stopped talking and had no communication until they met at a party of a mutual friend at the House of Billiards in central Arnhem. Polly wasn't expecting Wincy and was surprised when she showed up uninvited. Polly told her to leave and that she wasn't welcome she also confronted her about the comment she made on Facebook. An argument started, and the pair started pushing and shoving each other, and ended with Polly shouting that she was going to kill Wincy. Wincy left the billiards hall crying, and went home. Polly and Wincy took to social media, to write offensive things about the other. This went on for weeks, and Wincy confided in her close friends that she was actually worried about her safety, due to the nature of the threats Polly was putting on Facebook. But Wince's friends reassured her that Polly wouldn't do anything like that and that the two would probably become friends again in the near future. Although friends were wrong, being friends again was the last thing on Polly's mind. Polly had a boyfriend, 17-year-old Wesley from Rotterdam, he was infatuated with her, and it was with him she would conspire to shut Wincy up for good. Wesley thought himself to be a bit of a hard man, a tough nut, with so-called connections to the Chinese mafia. He wanted people to be wary of him, but most of his concocted stories were aimed at impressing Polly and her friends. But Wesley would eventually find someone, who would carry out his and his girlfriend's plan to kill Wincy. Jin Hao was barely a teenager, a 14-year-old son of Chinese immigrants, who moved and settled into the eastern side of Rotterdam. Jin Hao didn't have many friends and was always seen as an outsider to any group of people that he tried to hang around with. He was often mocked and wouldn't stay with the same circle of friends for very long. Unlike Wesley, he also wanted to be known as a tough guy. Polly and Wesley befriended the lonely Jin Hao and asked him if he would murder Wincy for them. Jin Hao agreed, he was eager to impress his new friends and to finally fit in. A price of 1,000 euros was agreed, but Polly wanted to pay 20 euros a month until this was paid, which eventually led them to reducing the contract killing price from 1,000 euros to 150 euros, and they would take him clubbing after the murder. He was so desperate to be friends with the group that he accepted this offer. Wincy and Polly continued to trade insults on Facebook and Twitter, but despite this, Polly got cold feet and decided that she didn't want to go ahead with the murder, so she contacted Jin Hao and called it off. However, this was short-lived, and after a few more insults back and forth on Facebook, she soon contacted Jin Hao to order her murder again, this time, it would be carried out. On January 12, 2012, Jin Hao caught a bus to Arnhem, where he made his way to Wince's home, when he arrived nobody was home, so he hung around for a few hours, hoping she would return. When Polly didn't return home, he gave up and left the area, much to the anger of Polly and Wesley, they demanded that he return to the house and kill her before the weekend, 
or Jin Hao himself would be murdered by Wesley's Chinese mafia connections. The next day, Friday the 13th of January 2012, Jin Hao contacted Wesley via Skype, and Wesley told him to be at Wince's house for 3 p.m., as she had a piano lesson at 2 for an hour. Jin Hao agreed to this, and told Wesley tomorrow was the day. Jin Hao wasn't the best at keeping his mouth shut though, and told his friend of his intentions, his friend wrote a post on Facebook saying, today, a girl will die at 3 p.m. Although the post was laughed off by most people. Jin Hao boarded a train to Arnhem, then caught a bus to the district where Wincy lived, and walked the short distance to her house. He arrived at the house and rang the doorbell. Wincy's dad Chun answered the door. Jin Hao asked if he could speak with Wincy, and Chun invited him in. Wincy was called, and then Chun left the two of them alone and went into another room. Jin Hao apologized, and said I'm sorry I have to do this, before pulling out a knife and plunging it into her neck, and then stabbing her in the face. Hearing the commotion, Chun stormed into the room and was immediately slashed across the face by Jin Hao, and then stabbed in the arm, he fought with him to defend his daughter, who had collapsed in a pool of blood, and also to disarm him of the knife. Wince's younger brother Wing Kit, upon seeing the attack, ran into another room to call the police, but Jin Hao had already broken free of Chun, and had fled on foot. Paramedics and police arrived within minutes, and rushed the pair to hospital, where Wince's condition was critical. Although Chun's injuries were bad, they proved to be non-life-threatening, however Wincy was in intensive care, and had not regained consciousness since she had collapsed during the attack. Jin Hao was arrested two hours later, hiding in some bushes not far from the crime scene. Police had to fire a warning shot to get him to surrender peacefully. At first, Jin Hao must have felt some loyalty towards his co-conspirators as he remained tight-lipped throughout his interrogation. He wasn't aware whether or not he had killed Wincy, but after a few days of being questioned by police without being charged with murder, he probably assumed that she survived the attack. On January the 17th, while Wincy was still in intensive care, he eventually told police that the whole murderous plot was Wesley's idea. Wincy would die from her injuries two days later on January the 19th, 2012. When police arrested Wesley at his home, he denied any involvement in the crime, and claimed that he didn't even know Jin Hao. It was when detectives discovered all of the Skype calls and the text messages, giving full details of the plan to murder Wincy, that he finally told investigators the whole story and gave up Polly. Polly was arrested at her home on January the 24th, 2012, on suspicion of conspiring to murder Wincy Howe. She didn't deny that she had played some part in Wincy's murder, but blamed Wesley for taking things too far by contacting Jin Howe, and that Jin Howe had been too eager to murder Wincy. She told officers how she and Wesley tried to call off the murder, but Jin Howe carried on regardless, against their wishes. But Wesley told investigators, that the whole idea to kill Wincy, came from Polly, who felt betrayed by what Wincy had written about her on her Facebook wall, and that he was only a go-between for Polly and Jin Hao. He said that he had no involvement in the planning or carrying out of the murder. All three conspirators admitted a part role in the murder of Wincy, but blamed each other on taking the lead role. Jin Hao was first in court. He was charged with premeditated murder, an attempted manslaughter of her father, Chun. As he'd only just turned 15, he could not be tried as an adult. Jin Hao's defense argued that he only carried out the murder because Polly and Wesley threatened to have him and his family killed if he didn't go through with it, and Jin Hao believed they would. The defense also said Jin Hao had mental problems, who may not have been in control of his own actions. On September 3, 2012, the judges delivered their verdict, Jin Hao was guilty on both charges. Polly was next, she was charged with two counts of conspiracy to commit murder, her trial was held behind closed doors. Her defense claimed she never truly intended for Wincy to be murdered, and that Wesley and Jin Hao both conspired by themselves to please her. Wesley was also tried behind closed doors, also charged with two counts of conspiracy to commit murder. 
His defense blamed the whole thing on Polly, and that she had pressurized him into going along with it. Just like Jin Hao, both Polly and Wesley were found guilty of all charges. The sentences imposed on the three caused uproar in the Netherlands. For their part in the murder, both Polly and Wesley received two years in a juvenile detention center. For the murder of Wincy Howe and the attempted murder of her father Chun, Jin Hao was sentenced to just one year in a juvenile detention center, one year's probation, and three years of therapy. Between the three of them, they would spend a total of five years in juvenile detention for murdering Wincy. Can you imagine your daughter getting brutally murdered and the killers only getting a pitiful sentence like that? I think they must be smoking too much of the wacky stuff over there. The next story comes from the UK, home of the Queen, the Beatles, and where it rains all the time. Peter Chapman was born in Darlington, northeast England, and brought up by his grandparents in neighboring Stockton upon Tees. By the time he was 19, he was already serving a seven year sentence for raping two teenage prostitutes. On his release in 2002, he was arrested by Cheshire police for the kidnap and rape of a prostitute in Ellesmere Port, the case was dropped due to lack of evidence. In the years that followed, he would fall under suspicion for a number of attacks on women, but would always escape prosecution. Online, Chapman would call himself DJ Pete, or Peter Cartwright, and used pictures of young men to pose as an attractive teenager to get young girls to send him pictures of themselves. In reality, Chapman was a scruffy man, with hardly any teeth left, he was unemployed, homeless, and was living out of his car, he had very little chance of meeting women and so turned to the internet. At this point, he has around 3,000 friends on Facebook, all of them being female, and between the ages of 13 and 31. Chapman tried to meet up with a 15-year-old girl in Hartlepool, the girl was expecting a handsome young man to meet her, but it was Chapman who turned up looking scruffy and had teeth like a caveman's necklace. She instantly ran away. He decided to change tactics when he arranged to meet the next girl. Ashley Hall was a happy 17-year-old girl, as like most girls her age, her mobile phone and the internet featured in her everyday life, she was well liked by her friends and had around 400 friends on Facebook, all of them she knew. However, in September, Ashley added a good-looking, 17-year-old young man, going by the name of Peter Cartwright. Ashley was one of the 173 people to accept him as a friend on Facebook, all of whom were young women. One month later, Chapman, posing as Cartwright, enticed Ashley to meet him in person, the unsuspecting teenager packed an overnight bag, and told her mum she was going to stay at friends. Posing as Cartwright, he messaged Ashley again, saying that his dad would be picking her up, and apologizing for his father's scruffy appearance also using that as an excuse for him not coming in to meet Ashley's mum. Ashley was taken in, texting the bogus dad, his here now babe. He picked up Ashley in his filthy Ford Mondeo, posing as the dad. Chapman took Ashley to a deserted lay-by, bound her with duct tape, and forced her to perform a sex act on him, he then raped and suffocated her, then dumped her body in a ditch. After killing Ashley, Chapman drove around for hours before being pulled over by the police as his car flagged up as having no valid insurance. He was arrested for several motoring offences and was taken to Middlesbrough Police Station, where he told officers, I killed somebody last night, I need to tell somebody where the body is. Hey, come down here, please. Right, do you remember what you sent me in the cell? Yeah, I killed yeah. somebody last night, I need to tell somebody from CID where the body is. Right, this is what I've written. I wrote six of these from CID, and I killed someone last night. Yeah. Do you agree that's true? What was the last thing you said there about you need to tell them where the body is? Because yeah. it hasn't been reported yet. Right, do you agree with me? They're going to need my phones open and they're probably able to do something. Well, I've got the written down here, just don't make it to the moment. I've got the when the detention officer visited you, you say, I want to speak to someone from CID, like, I killed someone last night. When brought to the desk, you'll say, I need to tell them where the body is, because it's not been reported yet. They're going to need my
to go back to write what he said. Right, he just said, stand up and let me. Police said he then led them to the ditch, where they found Ashley's fully clothed body. Hundreds of people attended the funeral of the much-loved teenager. Ashley's mother said in a statement, Ashley was loving, honest, caring, and well-liked, everybody loved her. Sex offender Peter Chapman has admitted to the kidnap, rape and murder of a teenager he ensnared on the internet. 17-year-old Ashley Hall's body was found dead in October after she met Chapman on a social networking site. Today, Ashley's mother, seen here on the right, attended Teesside Crown Court, where she witnessed her daughter's murderer dramatically change his plea to guilty. The Darlington teenager, who was studying childcare, was found dead in a farmer's field near Sedgefield, County Durham. She'd been strangled and left near a known lover's lane. On the 8th of March 2010, at Teesside Crown Court, Peter Chapman pleaded guilty to the kidnapping, rape, and murder of Ashley Hall, and was told he must serve at least 35 years in prison for taking Ashley's life. The judge labelled him a great danger to young women, adding for what it's worth, I cannot foresee your release. Let's hope he stays there. Subscribe to my channel to see more videos like this. Thank you for watching, see you in the next video.